Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 223rd New Social Environment. I'm Henry Addison, a production assistant here at the Brooklyn Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation between Enrique Martinez Celaya and Eleanor Hartney. We're also thrilled to have the poet David St. John here, who will read to close today's program. To begin, I ask you to join me in acknowledging the Wappinger, Kanarsi, Munsee, and Lenni Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation, the traditional owners of Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters on which we stand. The Brooklyn Rail stands in solidarity with the uprisings in response to the murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Tony McDade, Nina Pop, David McAtee, James Scurlock, Jamel Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Rashad Brooks, Rhea Milton, Dominique Remy Pels, Toyin Salau, Walter Wallace Jr., Casey Goodson, and countless others we have lost to white supremacy and police violence in this country. And we acknowledge that justice will come from the streets, from the nation demanding accountability and refusing to move on until Black Lives Matter in the eyes of the state. Before I introduce our host, we'd like to begin with a brief moment of silence. Thank you. And now to introduce today's host. Eleanor Hartney is well known as a curator and critic, a longtime contributing editor of Art in America, and the author of numerous books, including Art in Today, Postmodernism, and After the Revolution, Women Who Transformed Contemporary Art. Eleanor, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you all for coming. Yes, and it is today my distinct pleasure to introduce Enrique Martinez Celaya, who is an, a remarkable artist and an amazing polymath. He was born in Cuba, raised in Spain and Puerto Rico, and now lives in California. Originally, he studied science, receiving a Bachelor of Science degree uh, in Applied Physics and a minor in Electrical Engineering from Cornell University. He followed up with this with a Master of Science degree from the University of California in Berkeley with a specialization in quantum electronics. But then after this, on his way to a PhD, he did an abrupt turn and changed to art, earning an MFA from the University of California, Santa Barbara. He is currently the Provost Professor of Humanities and Arts at the University of Southern California. He is a highly respected artist and an author of numerous books and articles on art, poetry, and philosophy. He is also the founder of the publishing company, Whale and Star. Enrique is as conversant in literature, philosophy, and physics as he is with art. These are all incorporated into his paintings and sculptures, which employ an artistic vocabulary of imagery drawn from nature and imagination. Uh, our discussion today will be wide ranging, talking uh, about many different topics, but we want to touch particularly on a pair of upcoming exhibitions, which he will introduce in a moment in a, in a short video. But before we turn to that, I just want to read a quote um, from an article that he wrote in 2008, which to me kind of sums up a lot of his, his um, ideas as an artist. As I see it, the aspiration of the artist's work is to dissolve the dis distance between self and the cosmos, thereby uniting being and language, memory and nothingness, life and death. These are perhaps lofty claims on behalf of pigments, metal and wood, but the disparity between the aims and means of art is its essence. So Enrique, it's wonderful to, ha to have you here on Zoom um, and, and to be seeing you virtually. And um, perhaps what we should do now is to take a look at, at these, this video, which introduces these two recent bodies of work. And we'll talk about those a little bit and then I think move on to um, some other topics. So you're, you're on. Sounds great. Well, thank you. Thank you for, for this conversation, Eleanor. And thank you for all of you for being been here to join us. So let, we're going to see a very brief um, 
video that we produced, giving you a kind of a quick snapshot of two of the current exhibitions I'm opening this uh, this February. And and um, when do we go? We take a look at that and we talk at the other end of it. Oh, thank you. That was beautiful. Thank you. So Enrique, as I understand it, both of these bodies of works were things that you worked on during COVID, and yet they're very different. And I guess I'd love to know a little bit about in what way are they responses to COVID, to you know the, the situation that we find ourselves in, and, and how do you see them as relating to each other? Um, <clears throat> originally, the the Kowitz, the collaboration with Kitty Kowitz 
was proposed to me about a year and a half ago. So before COVID really had started, maybe even longer. So in some ways it's a coincidence that not just COVID, but all the social unrest, all the challenges that we have seen, the injustice, all the, all the things that we have seen over the past year and a half, so, so closely um, resonate with COVID's work. And so working um, on these pieces in sort of collaboration with her was particularly uh, poignant during this time of COVID. Um, the exhibition that opens at Bowen Gallery in Aspen, the third of the night, um, moving in parallel, and even though they look looks very different to the COVID's work, um, in my mind, they respond to some of the same concerns, to the fragility and vulnerability of this moment, the, the challenges that we were all facing, the isolation, the sense of loneliness that, that, I, that we felt. And in some ways, um, the, that, that exhibition uh, and the exhibition in Berlin began to sort of uh, conceptually weaved into each other, even though visually, like you said, they look very different. Wow. Yeah, and I mean, the, um, the, the third of the night, I was really struck by that, I don't know, it's, it's sort of a sense of, of being suspended in time, which is, I guess, very much how we all feel right now in the time of COVID. We're sort of in this weird in-between place. And it, it feels, the, the works, the images feel like they're sort of coming from that place as well. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that's that's right. That suspension that you speak, speak about is something I felt, and many of us felt, and and it plays. It, it, it partly there are many ways in to be suspended. One of the suspensions I was most interested in is when time seems to stand still in some manner, and our relationship to to mm. what's outside of ourselves um, become a question. Really, what what is this relationship? and watching the impassiveness of the universe, <clears throat> the impassiveness of the world sometimes to all these human problematics um, that makes us seem so fragile in comparison yeah. to, 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 to say stars, which is one of the things I use yeah. for the third of the night. Yeah, well, I mean, and it's interesting because I mean, in, in both bodies of work, there are these sort of images of, of the stars, but in the Colwitz work, it's it seems in a way much more it's much more anguished in a way and and there is a kind of sense of of being in a you know in, in a world full of sort of turbulent political upheaval which is of course what her work is very much about which is it has is a different kind of feeling so when you were working on these two bodies of work you were doing them in tandem sort of going back and forth from one to the other is is that sort of how it worked yeah and you know the Kowitz Kowitz is somebody who I have admired since I was in my teenage years and I keep Kowitz works in my studio and so on. So I felt it was a gift to be able to work um, on this body of work using her drawings as a, as a source material. But I couldn't anticipate, I couldn't anticipate that things were going to be so, um, so significant um, mm -hmm. for, for, the, for what we were going through as a, as a, as a society, as a world. So, yeah. and I typically, my work is not political like Kowitz is. Um, yeah. I, so, so it was a great opportunity to get into the humanity of Kowitz in, and, and to see how these concerns that seem to belong to Germany, you know, from say 1920s to 1945 yeah. or before were so resonant with the sense of, of poverty, disenfranchisement, mm -hmm. oppression, yeah. Um, that we that many of us were feeling uh, during this time and 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 the social unrest going on in response to this right. to these things seemed to echo what was happening in Germany a right. long, seemingly a long time ago. Right. Yeah. So so one of the bodies of work sort of looks in, the other sort of looks out more. Yeah. yeah. Well, you, one of the things that I've always loved about your work, and I, I it's something I think we sort of share is is a kind of sense that. Um, you know, you're you're willing to un embrace sort of unfashionable ideas, like you know the idea of truth, you know the idea of spirituality, um, you know the idea of sincerity, and 
I'd like to maybe dig into that a little bit, and because I know you, you're also, um, as well as being a, a wonderful painter and, and sculptor, a very gifted writer, and you've written quite a bit about this. But this question of truth is something that comes up quite a bit when you're talking about art and life. I mean, what do you mean by truth? What does, how, how do you, and, and how do you kind of, in, in, in a kind of world of, of kind of fake news, alternative facts, and sort of, you know, postmodern irony, how do you manage to hold on to a notion of truth? You know, that is, that is a great question that I, that, that is a, an important source of, um, of momentum for me and, and influence. I mean, I think one of the uh, recognitions is that truth, I am as aware as anyone else of the problematics of making claims for authenticity or for truth. I know the arguments and despite the arguments, I still see the importance and validity of truth. Partly this comes from having been a scientist. I think mm -hmm. it's very difficult to be, uh, to be a scientist who, for whom truth is not part of the negotiation. I mean, at the end of the day, science is ultimately in an inquiry in search of truth in different, different forms. And I think that while problematic and full of um, sort of uh, modifications or some sort of uh, adjustments, truth is, is to me what gives meaning uh, to life. I mean, I think ultimately we live in a, in a meaningless space that we create meaning through work, we create meaning to, to the life we create, the choices we make, and, and some organization needs to exist to make those mm -hmm. choices. And that organization, in my case, is a question of what is true and, and what truth is, and how can one's life respond to this calling, not just in words mm -hmm. that we tell each other, but in day-to-day -day, um, actions as, relate, as relating to the world. That's, I think it's very interesting. Uh, and I'd like to maybe push a little further about that. The truth of science and the truth of art. I mean, how are they the same and how are they different? Um, I mean, I think truth is truth. I mean, you, you can, you, they, I think in art, we have, we have a, a different kind of uh, questions. You know, we, some, some people like to think of art as sort of, sort of a cultural production. But, but in, my, in my understanding of art, art ultimately is an inquiry um, an inquiry towards truth as poetry, some sort of search for what are the foundations of truth. So, so the truth of science are the truth of the order of things, how the universe is built and, and, and scientists pursue that. And I think the truth of, that we seek in art is a, is a clarity, a sort of a, a moment in which mm -hmm. somehow there's a clearing and the confusion. We live in with tremendous confusion. Uh, our lives mostly are, are made of um, just an assembly of poorly understood ideas and feelings. And I think what I, what I go to in art is to find a clarity, a way in which the world opens and truth sort of unconceals and reveals itself to, to be as some sort of brightness. You know, the, the problem with this question, which is so important that you're asking, is that words especially very quickly talking. Words kind of failed. You have to describe things as brightness, as clearings, which are really metaphors. And they're mm -hmm. sloppy and they're blurry. Um, while this is, this is something that to do it justice, um, you have to say something a little bit clearer. But let me say, besides words, it's easy to see in the same way it is easy to see when somebody that you meet is present and and, and not full of mask and pretensions. It's easy to see that, but it's difficult to explain what you're looking at. Mm. So mm. truth in some ways have that same, um, is that same quality. It's easy to point to it, or maybe not easy, but it's easier to point to it than to try to articulate what you're pointing to. Well, that, and another aspect of your work that sort of relates to this is your, you know, your, your work, um, is very, I mean, this is a, it's a problematic word, but that, you know, it, it's very engaged with spirituality or the notion of, I guess, a, the, you know, of a, of, a, of a reality that's larger or beyond what we um, immediately see and experience. 
And um, in fact, I think you have said at one point, um, you know, that you work in a religious manner. And I want to talk a little bit about religion and spirituality. But first, uh, one thing that, that struck me, again, you know, as a scientist, we assume now, you know, that sort of science and spirituality, you know, are generally seen as being on opposite poles, you know, that, that they, you know, that science is about a kind of materialistic objective truth and spirituality is about a different kind of reality or truth. But in fact, you know, I've been doing a lot of research lately on spiritualism for a, a project that I'm working on. And, you know, in the 19th century, there really was not that kind of hard and fast distinction between science and spirituality. Um, you know, a lot of the, um, you know, scientists, uh, you know, people like William James, you know, were looking for a, a really, um, you know, scientific proof of life beyond death. Um, you know, there, there was so much interest in, um, you know, the, uh, the telegraph, you know, all of these, these kind of new technologies that were sort of invisible. And so scientists didn't necessarily see that there was a, a separation between these two things. And I, I'm wondering if, you know, in your, your switch from science to, um, to art, I mean, were you able to tap into that? Or did you feel, you know, that, that you were leaving behind a, um, you know, a world that was sort of so s more skeptical of spirituality? How, how did you reconcile those two things? I think before I was a scientist, when I was a young, a young kid, um, partly because of my nature, partly because of exile and migration and the dislocation that comes with that. Um, there was always a sense that I understood very little what was going on, that there was a lot of things that I needed to figure out. And that's why I became interested in science, philosophy and art. And I painted it as a young person to sort the world out. So anybody who then goes to science with those concerns, has to be has to marvel. Anybody has to look at equations and look at the world, how the world works, has to marvel at the incredible beauty, I guess, uh, um, resonance, uh, largeness that one is confronted with, and and the words that one would want to use to describe that universe, that discovery of physics, is very similar to the way one wants to discover a spiritual experience. I think I think the, the the outer almost always outer reach quality, but right there, showing you the magnificence of things as they are, is um, is it has a lot to do with I think a spiritual ex uh, experiences. I think as you as you correctly said, for me I don't have a religious practice, but is the is the the questions of theology that are, are the ones that are seem to me the most urgent. The question of our place in in the universe, the question of mortality, choices and ethics, those 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 um, type of concerns, which have always been the territory of religion and spirituality and mm -hmm. theology, are to me much more interesting than the social dynamics or power structures, mm -hmm. which I feel that are more transitory. Mm -hmm. So, so. I don't know if that answers your question, but I, I, I don't see that separation that people like to say so distinct between science, philosophy, art. And in fact, like you properly correctly said, you know, in the 17th, 18th century, um, ph physics was philosophy of life. People were trying mm -hmm. to figure out how life works. So, um, so this distinction that we sometimes make a big deal out of it and create and try curriculums about the distinctions are really actually much closer to each other that um, that we sometimes give them credit to be. Right. Right. And and have you in the course of your career? I mean, you your work. Uh, uh, yeah. Again, I mean, this this world word spirituality can be a kind of difficult one. I mean, it means sort of different things. But have you have you faced, I guess, pushback against that aspect of your work? <clears throat> um, I mean, I think from the beginning, you know, I I. There's a tendency in the triumph of the sciences for the last 150 years. I made the humanities and arts very insecure. So everybody wants to seem rigorous and, and, and really theoretical and so on. So when you begin to talk about ideas like authenticity or truth or whatever, you seem like a simpleton to everyone. You don't mm -hmm. understand what's going on, really. You don't really know what's happening. So of course you get pushback when you use these words. 
I try to stay away from words like spirituality because I think sometimes they tend to summarize too much and I'd rather be more specific. And instead I say what I mean when I want to use the word spirituality. Um, but yeah, I mean, I have, I've gotten a lot of pushback um, and also because being a, a, Latin, a Latin artist, yeah. um, there are certain expectations um, in the contemporary art world of what are proper concerns mm-hmm. for, for a Latin artist of some sort. So somebody coming in with this kind of philosophy backwater kind of apparent talk that I give, yeah. it seems not to fit anything <laughs> very well. <laughs> Right, right. Yeah, that, yeah, you're not supposed to be too intellectual, I guess, right? Yeah. I, I not. guess not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and and sort of relating to that, you know, this the other kind of aspect of your work that I I feel, you know, I, I very strongly is this kind of sense of I guess we could call it sincerity, um or we could say that it's a reaction against or a a dismissal of the kind of notion of of irony of postmodern irony that that is so kind of pervasive um in the world today and in fact i have another yeah as i say i love the way you write so i have another kind of great quote of yours um here um i have found irony not to be an exciting destination but the tiresome quicksand from which i must always depart irony and suspicion are embedded in the spiritual foundation of many of us Therefore, it takes effort to build anything trustworthy and particularly anything resembling ethics and beliefs capable of surviving the erosion of time, time that toys with our convictions and renders our present into memories. So I guess, how do we, you know, how do we escape from the irony of our time? I mean, you, your work, you're trying to do that, but it, it's true that it's, it's, a, it's such a sort of pervasive sense um, sort of irony and along with it sort of cynicism and it, it becomes more and more difficult, I guess, you know, to to believe, especially, you know, we, we think about the, you know, kind of recent events and kind of the whole world getting turned upside down. How do we, how, how do we avoid irony? And, and, you know, how has irony shaped us and in sort of, you know, difficult ways? Yeah, that's a, a key question. Um, Peter Sloterdijk um, wrote a book called The Critique of Cynical Reason, where he tries to outline how cynicism have become so entrenched in, in our interior, in the political and financial structures that we have in our society, that it's almost indistinguishable from contemporary consciousness. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, so making a lot of claims for ourselves being outside of it is... Um, is that you know those claims are often suspicious, including when I make them. So I think it's a day-to-day effort to recognizing oneself that cynical tendency. I mean, I think the cynic in many ways once was a believer, usually. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, it wouldn't be so entrenchedly cynical. So the question is, despite all the arguments for being cynical at this moment despite all the arguments for being ironic and want to mm-hmm. and see and see the lie behind almost everything. We all, if you're, you don't have to be that intelligent to be able to see behind the curtain and see how things really right. work. So the question is rather than put forward that critique of what's behind the curtain, I'd rather see what we can find and we can offer instead of the emptiness that is right behind that curtain. And that is a much harder, mm-hmm. um, task, I find that simply the task of criticizing or being cynical or ironic. And I, and of course, it's a task that requires recognizing how small one is, as small I am, to the task. It's always, it's always a task that we are too incomplete, too small, too inconsequential to take on. But, but that's precisely the reason to take it on. Um, and, and it gives meaning to one's effort. It gives meaning to my work meaning to my practice when I come to the studio. So oh, to, to follow up on, because I because that was actually it was very interesting and um, I'm not sure exactly where you got cut off, but um, you were sort of, you were talking about kind of the role of the artist, I think, and and you know kind of what the artist can do. And again, one of the things that you have 
um, said is that you feel that all artists should aspire to be prophets, which seems to kind of relate to this whole idea. What what do you mean by that? And how does that relate to this whole discussion of, of um, cynicism and sincerity? Yeah, the idea of a prophet is, is somebody who is, who is um, in the work of bringing forward the future and the future with a certain, um, uh, a certain commitment to that idea of truth that we're speaking about. So, so, in, so of course, with a task like that, when people hear the idea of profit, it seems like I'm making very big claims for the artist. And in fact, I am. But it doesn't mean that by recognizing how insignificant I am or small or how petty my knowledge or understanding is, I, I'm not up to the task. This is precisely because it's a task bigger than me that I want to pursue it. I mean, of what's easy and familiar and reachable, we all know too much. I think we all, we all become too familiar with diminished expectations, which is partly why we're in this cynical state that we are. So I want to devote my practice. When I left physics, which was a wonderful field that I was attached to, when I left it, I left it for a reason. And I, because I wanted certain qualities in my life and in my efforts um, day to day. And therefore I, I want to sign up for, for something like the idea of bringing forward the future as, as, as sincerely as I can, even though we both know that the idea of sincerity is full of holes and quite problematic. And yet it has to be somewhere there in the mix, um, however problematic. And I think that that is, is the way I see the idea of the prophet. The prophet is somebody who is committed to life. It's not like a mystic that separates and goes to some mountain and meditates for himself or herself. But it's somebody who comes back from that mountain and tries to offer um, something to the world. And it's not a selfish act, but it's an act of sharing. And this is something that you do not just with your art, but with your writing as well. And so maybe you could talk a little bit about that. How, how does your writing, um, you know, I guess, how does it feed your, your art and how does your art feed your writing? And how, how did this, how does that work? Because you, you, um, you write a great deal. You, you also, um, as I was saying, are very conversant in many different disciplines, which you draw on in both the writing and the art. Maybe it's more obvious in the, in the writing. How does that, how does writing, how does that work? The, the writing and the art, how do you relate those two? Yeah, the writing is very important to me as, as something I do. And also writers um, have been very influential to me, poets, um, novelists, um, since, I was very, since I was very young. And I find that in, in some ways, writers as a whole have been able to do more gracefully in individual arts to understand the critiques of lay modernism, understand the problematics that came up and yet remain committed to, to something other than a cultural production or the kind of conversations that you have in the ivory tower. You have a writer like Cesla Milos, a Polish poet, mm -hmm. that even though we can think of him as somebody who is at the you know, sharp edge of poetry, he's also extremely committed to the conditions in Eastern Europe, in Poland. And, and he doesn't see a separation between the two. There's mm -hmm. not a separation between being high art and be involved with the world. And I think many poets and many writers, particularly in, in Latin America and Europe have been able to do this. And for me, they have been an example of how you can try to have it all, to mm -hmm. be a serious artist, aware of, of, of what the discourse is and get involved with the world. So in my own, in my own writing, I, I write to address those areas of my concerns that cannot directly be addressed by, uh, by my visual projects. Uh, and I then weave them back into the visual projects that are the influence for many of them. And quite often they're, they're presented together. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that's the role of writing and it's, a, it's, it's an ongoing role, um, mm -hmm. always part of it. And you've also, I, I'd like to talk a little bit about your, your, your publishing venture and how does, that, how does that fit into it and how does that work? In 1998, I was interested in these poets that I felt that would never find trade publications, you know, 
partly because publishing, which has continued to shrink, um, has become, you know, it's a business. So quite often, if you can publish only a thousand books of poetry, it, it, nobody makes money in that. But I felt it was very important to, to bring this, this, uh, this writers forward, particularly some writers that perhaps we knew, uh, but new translations. For example, we did a translation of Anna Akhmatova, uh, mm. a Russian writer, Russian poet, done by poets, um, which is perhaps slightly different than other people uh, might take those translations. And I did it in collaboration with a professor, Kevin Platt, at uh, University of Pennsylvania. And we produced this book. Um, we brought forward uh, uh, Modigliani's drawings of Akhmatova as part of it. So trying to, trying to articulate something exciting and new about a writer that, that be, most people should know. And we have been lucky, the University of Nebraska Press distributed our books. And we have been lucky that they have had a, a reasonable reception. Um, and then we have done other collaborations with musicians and so on. And it's, it's really a labor of love uh, to, to use that sort of corny phrase. My studio uh, and, and I do them, we produce them, we design them here in house and we do a small editions. Um, and it has been an incredibly satisfying part of what we're doing. And then it connects also, we do some public programs for mostly for children in public schools to come to the studio. And we see that sort of outreach of the publishing house, mm -hmm. similar to the outreach that we do to the community. You know, sometimes as an artist, you are going to museums and galleries and sort of uh, an increasingly rarefied space. And it's wonderful to have a different kind of conversation mm -hmm. with the community than right. the one that happens in galleries and museums. The, you know, the, the you've, you've mentioned some of the writers that you've published and certainly some of the, the people who, writers who you admire, which are a very, it's a very wide, net that you have cast it's you know as, as you had said before um you know people like to box you as a latin artist you're supposed to have just a, a very sort of narrow set of concerns obviously you know you're a citizen of the world and and you know of the um you know kind of the whole wide range of of, of thinking that has gone out oh, i'm sorry about that hang on just a second let me um get rid of that Um, so, um, what I was interested in is, is how you got that way. I mean, you're, you, you, of course, come from a background, um, you, you know, were born in Cuba, you were raised in, in, um, Spain, you, you came to California. How did you get this sort of wider view of the world? Where is that, does that come from your background in some way? Um, it comes from my background, and there are a couple of things that contributed to it. One is the dislocation of exile. I left Cuba when I was seven, moved to Madrid during Franco. That, that kind of dislocation of exile and that exilic imagination of trying to figure out where is home sends you into the world seeking answers. I think um, there's a sense of deficit that one feels when you're in exile. And I think for me, literature um, in, in its broadest sense, I wouldn't see a distinction between a Russian writer like the Tolstoy that I read in Cuba because that's the books we got from mm -hmm. Russia um, between Tolstoy and Mario Benedetti or Vargas Llosa or, or, or an English writer or, or somebody like Joseph Conrad, which is also an exile. Mm -hmm. So those things, became to me the world. That one of the things that you gain as an exile is the world and the possibilities of, of something outside or from your own country. The other aspect that contributed is that a lot of people sometimes in America don't, don't realize that when you get, for example, the Puerto Rico of the 1970s, I went from Spain to Puerto Rico, was a very active political place. They were the idea of colonialism, the idea of political definition was incredibly important. And to find answers to that, um, people were reading Hegel and Marx and trying to figure out how to make sense of the colonial condition of the island in the 70s. And this was what was cool when I was a teenager. Yeah. Um, it was cool to try to read 
Immanuel Kant, even if you couldn't understand it. <laughs> so one of the interesting things is when people look at all this German influence in my work, they don't understand how a Latin guy will have it when in fact, the Puerto Rico, the 1970s, every one of my friends were reading these things. And that's, that was an education for me. I have great teachers that led me to find these things. And, and the quest became, um, where are the answers? So if the answers I was going to find there is Thomas Mann or, or Bulgakov or Hemingway, um, that's where I was going to find them. There was no, the whole world was accessible to me. And I think, I think that's the one benefit that I think you get out of this location, mm -hmm. uh, that, that to try to reorganize your sense of identity again, you feel that everything is at play. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. And I'm curious about as you know, so you were talking about how you were thinking when you were young, how is your, has, has your work, has your thinking changed as you've gotten older? I mean, if you were to talk about sort of the trajectory of your work, is there a, a direction, you know, starting from that place that it is gone? In some ways, embarrassingly, no. It has. <laughs> when, I, when I look back at my paintings when I was 11 and 12, even though, you know, they, there was a lot of things I didn't know, um, I see the, the continuity of concerns. I mean, I think perhaps this is true of most of us. I think most of us have two or three things that, that define mm -hmm. our preoccupations and that define our lives. And we can see this through line moving through things. And what we do quite often is, is find support and, and a way to, to, to amplify those early concerns and to clarify them. So, so in some manner, I have had very, a very limited evolution. In other ways, I have been very fortunate to, to have had all these opportunities. You know, I, I grew up in a, in a you know, sort of poor place in Spain and where you know, we didn't know anything other than when people used to ask me about Madrid and so on, I didn't know anything beyond my block. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the way we grew up. So I feel very lucky that I have had the opportunities I have had, but in many ways, um, I am not fundamentally a different consciousness that I was when I was 13 or 14. Wow. And if you were to define some of those through lines, what would you say that they are? I think the, the central one, which sounds generic, but it has very specific applications and today is, is, uh, what is, what is, who am I and what my, what's my relationship to the world? This is a fundamental question we all have, but to me, it has always had an urgency. I couldn't, I couldn't take it as a given that I was a Cuban or that I was from this family or whatever. I always felt that these were all questions that needed uh, better answers than the ones I had. Um, I think also I've always been very, very concerned with the choices that we make, how our choices make and how do we value them? And then the question of truth, which is, if you'd rotate it a little bit, it's a question of beauty. Uh, mm -hmm. The beautiful, not in the pretty, but you know what I mean, mm -hmm. sort of yeah. the larger question of the beautiful. And, um, and I think that this, you know, I, I initially I tried them in religion when I was a kid. I tried them in physics, I tried them in literature, I tried them in philosophy, I tried them in art. I have been, and if you tomorrow suggest to me another way to approach it, mm. um, I, I, will, I will incorporate that. I don't mm -hmm. see, I, I'm interested in everything because ultimately what's behind that interest is a concern for more clarity, a better understanding. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that's interesting that having gone through all these disciplines, you ended up, I mean, you're still involved with them in a way, but, but you ended up with art. What did art have to offer you that those other disciplines didn't? That's, nobody has asked me that, that, that way, and that's a very good way to ask it. Uh, art, art allow the possibility of everything being in. When I was a scientist and I walk into the lab, a lot of my concerns had to be left outside of the lab. The, like the questions of, the, the incredible questions I have of memory or of where we are or my family or a glance that my father might have done at some moment, that, that's outside. And I came into the lab as a brain to figure out some scientific problem. 
And I felt that life is too short, that I didn't have the luxury of doing that. We tend to think of STEM fields or science mm -hmm. as, as really practical and, and not luxury at all. But I, I found that it was very luxurious to imagine that for the next 50 years, I will pause asking questions that were so urgent to me that I will always have time to take them on later on. And I thought, I need something that everything is in. This conversation we're having can be part of my work. Um, any preoccupation that happens day to day is part of my work. So art allows everything that I that that is important to me, every urgency, every failure, um, everything to be in the work as material as well as aim. So. So I think that that's, that's why, I, why I decided to devote myself fully to art. I've always done it, but I needed to do it all the time. And, you know, family is part of art. Everything is part of art. Wow. And I think we're soon going to go to questions. But before we do, I just wanted to ask a little bit about your working process, because we saw in the video, there's that wonderful sort of time lapse um, of you creating that painting. And what, what thing that was very interesting to me is the way that it was, you you started with a certain composition. And then at one point you, you kind of obliterated half of it and then you sort of came back to it. So obviously a kind of intuitive way of thinking. And then finally in the end, this kind of very amazing and surprising rose that appears. So um, is, is I guess, how do you work? I mean, how is your working process? What what kind of an idea do you start with, and where does it where does it go, and what what makes it change? I start usually with 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 a series of questions that are quite abstract um, and and has no imagery associated with it quite often. And I do a number of writings, and then that begin and then I begin to work on many works at once. I take a model of the museum or gallery I'm working with, and begin to try to conceptualize. Uh, how all those questions can be given shape um, as, as, a, as an environment. And then I begin to work in many paintings at once. And the evolution that you saw of, the, of that painting is actually a very conservative evolution. My paintings usually change much more dramatically. Here I was, I was anchored by a particular drawing of Kowitz, which was providing a, a, a continuity. But so often in my work, the changes are more dramatic, which is why I could never have an assistant that I could tell them do my work for me because I never know what tomorrow will bring to that work and I cannot be prescriptive about it. And, and that's why all my work and all my environments and I might do something like a refrigerated bed for the Berlin Philharmonic that looks nothing like the paintings I just show you. So each work is its own series of concerns and I'm not interested in the product idea or the continuity of visual experience that, that artists, especially painters quite often have. So my process is one of inquiry um, where I work in many things at once at the same time I write, I go back between the two. Sometimes I move from painting to sculpture, occasionally to photograph and video in search of something where there's a lot of destruction along the way. Mm -hmm. uh, people quite often come to my studio, they like their work, they come back next week and it's completely gone. Um, so, and I think that depends on that evolution and that destruction to clarify what I'm after. Um, years ago, um, I remember Allen Ginsberg mentioning the idea that in art, the first idea is the most important, the second one and everything else. For me, it's like the seventh idea <laughs> is the one that is important because I find out long before then I am, I am working in a very superficial manner and not quite, not quite uh, what I should be after, but it takes me a while to realize that. And you also do work in sculpture as well. Um, is that a different process? Well, it's different, it's different in the sense that some of the monumental bronzes that I do, um, you know, once you commit to something, is, is then you're really mm -hmm. following through with it. And I quite often do my own, uh, you know, carving and everything myself because I, again, because I don't really know what I'm after until I see it, until I understand it. It is different and, and video and photographs are also different, but, but I am willing to, to destroy anything I'm doing. And even in, in 
sculptures that I have worked on for a long time, I would chop half of it out or um, that, that sculpture that we show from, from the exhibition of the Bowen Gallery in Aspen, they, that sculpture was completely changed at the end. And, and even though it meant chopping things and doing all that, but um, everything is up for grabs. And like, I am, not, I am fully invested, but also fully detached from everything that I'm doing. So, so I don't mind transforming or destroying something if I don't feel um, there's some, some truth to it. And, and I mean, these two works, the, these two bodies of work are, are, are sort of coherent series. Do you tend to always work in series like that? I do, I do. And, and, I, and I always anchor or, or revolving around a particular exhibition space. So I usually do a model out of uh, when the moment I commit to an exhibition and I begin to think how people move through it, begin to think of the circumstances of that city or whatever. And I always work like that. It's very difficult for me now to just work, work in one thing uh, at a time, just one painting or one sculpture. It's always a continuity, continuity of preoccupation, partly because when I start Eleanor, I don't really know what I'm, interested in about it why am i concerned with this why is this why is this hole here and only after i have worked for six months to a year or something i begin to understand oh this is what's here and once it's done then i can never repeat it i can never do another version of it so people sometimes say do you have another work like this one that you did three years ago and quite often i do not hmm. because that that those concerns are kind of uh, exhausted once I get yeah. to the other to the other side. Yeah. And, and one last question. Behind you, we see a, a kind of diagrammatic, you know, blackboard, it looks like. What is that? What are we looking at back there? So the, the triangle here is is Kandinsky's evolution of the of the idea of the avant-garde, that that the tr top of the triangle at any moment in time in a society are people who who are sort of pushing certain ideas. And, and then that triangle moves up and eventually what was originally just understood by a very few gets understood by a bigger, by a bigger aspect mm -hmm. of the population. This is for, my, for one of my poetry classes. I was talking about the idea of the yeah. avant-garde and the other notes around me are from uh, Boris Pasternak and Marina Svetaeva's uh, poetry, two Russians, two important Russian mm -hmm poets that I love very much. And I, every excuse I can, I, I try to insert them into every one of my classes. <laughs> All right. Well, I think we're probably, um, Henry, I think has been monitoring questions. So I, I think we're ready to move to a, a Q and A now. Um, so I- yeah. Thank you so much, Enrique and Eleanor, for delivering a fantastic conversation in spite of all of the turbulence, <laughs> but how appropriate. Um, I would just say uh, I, I'm reminded of one of my favorite quotes, um, construction, not destruction, is the name of the human game. And it is um, just very um, applaudable that you have both committed yourselves to that. Um, and so for our first question, we are going to go to a Brooklyn Rail favorite, Lynn Crawford. Um, and you should be able to unmute yourself and I'll work on getting your video up as well. Sorry for the delay. We should be ready to go. Lynn, are you able to? Oh, hi. Yeah, to? sorry. Oh, great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this is so wonderful. And I just, I have a question for you. Do you think um, irony and cynicism are the same thing? Or do you distinguish between those two? No, they're, they're not the same thing. Um, um, you know, uh, irony, uh, we, we are, we, irony is, is, uh, is, is, Irony is a way, and some people, by the way, that I respect um, value irony. Irony is, is you are not in the same place. A cynic, I think the cynical condition 
is one in which you have lost um, some capacity to believe in, in, in the possibilities. The cynic, the cynic in some ways um, have seen behind that curtain that I speak about, has seen the conditions of, of whatever they are being cynic, cynical about, society usually quite often about themselves and their own um, agency um, and have decided that, that, um, that possibilities are not longer there. And uh, irony is somebody who recognizes, um, who recognizes some condition or some problem of some sort. And, and instead of tackling directly, um, rotates the critique about it to reveal some lie about it or some, or some, some, uh, some poverty in the construction of that reality. Um, so, so in some ways, the distinction between the two for me is that the, um, the people who is ironic tends to point at something that because sometimes the direct way is not accessible um, to do. And in that pointing reveals, tries to reveal some, some fundamental uh, problematic that exists. The cynic is a more entrenched condition of being that you don't think possibilities are available. Now, these are not definitions of cynicism or irony, and I'm sure somebody like Sloterdijk will have a contention with what I'm saying, but I think operationally, that's how they seem to behave in life for me. Do you think um, a writer, like you mentioned Borges, um, do you think sometimes people use humor uh, as a way to be ironic? Whereas maybe in cynicism, they they don't use humor or? Yeah, I mean, I think humor sometimes is the, is the, <laughs> the only weapon that sometimes we're left with to contend with situations that are unbearable. Um, and, um, I and I think uh, the cynic can also be humorous, but there's a certain bitterness to the humor of a cynic that sometimes the ironist do not, does not show as much bitterness. Um, and, and, you know, humor is a complex thing. I think people who use it well, uh, some novelists and poets who use humor well. Yeah, I think Borges is a, uses humor well, would you? Yeah, yeah, and, and it, it's very difficult to do so. It's very difficult to be humorous and serious at once. And, and the people who are able to do it are uh, spectacular and commendable, I think. I think it's, um, it's not an easy thing to do. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lynn. Um, we're now going to move over to uh, Casey's question. Casey, you should be able to unmute yourself now. Hey. Hello? Yep. Oh yeah, we can hear you. Excellent. Enrique, it's so great to see you. Uh, <laughs> greetings from Hanover. I have a specific question. Uh, I know from your work and working in your studio, and I saw that in the video as well, it's, it's, it's about that moment when you step back from the work and you look at it. Uh, I, I want, I'm interested in that conversation. Is that Enrique, the observer, asking questions of the work that is in progress so that Enrique the observer could then talk to Enrique the, Enrique the artist to talk to the painting or the work that is being created. I'm just interested in that moment of pause where you are reflecting between you and, and the work uh, that you're looking at and working on. Thank you, Casey, it's great to hear your voice. Um, and um, so I think it's a relationship. Um, it's very similar to a relationship that you have with somebody you care about or that you love. That you sometimes, there's a moment in which you have to be separated enough to understand what that experience of that relationship is. So you can see it and you can see yourself and your own actions in the relationship. And at the same time, be invested and part of it. Because without that investment and part of it, then you become you just become a critic or an observer. So it, it's, a, it's a strange dance that, um, 
is difficult to understand, but I think in the question that Eleanor asked me before about what has evolved or what has changed since you were younger, one of the things that have changed is my capacity, my ability to be simultaneously in and out of the work. So, so quite often I used to, when I was younger, I was either thinking about it and I was, or I was on it. I couldn't be both at once. And that backing up away from the work and looking at it um, quite often is both thinking about it and being on it, being invested and being detached. That's sort of the process that is going on. Um, I think, I think when, when artists or writers look at the work without the proper amount of bullshit meter or with a proper amount of distance, um, we become too invested and too enamored of our gestures or our words or our sentences. Um, so you need certain amount of detachment from it. But if there's no urgency, if there's no need, um, and the need and urgency only come from investment, then, then everything is the same as everything else. So you need to kind of entertain both of them at the same time. I hope that makes sense. No, that's great. Thank you so much. And thank you, Casey, for the question. Um, we're now going to go over to my colleague, uh, Malvika. You should be able to unmute yourself. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for this conversation. Uh, it's been uh, really informative and uh, you know, good being here. Um, I wanted to ask sort of, I've, I've been thinking during this talk about the duration or the temporality of dislocation from the world um, and sort of this framework of sort of irony or postmodernism or what have you seeming more like a harmful perpetual state of dislocation uh, versus possibly exile as perhaps a more productive moment of dislocation or disbelief or discomfort uh, with the world and its symbols. And I was wondering if you could possibly speak to this a bit more. Are these, are these two things kind of like a two ends of a binary or do, do you feel that they are related? I mean, I think the exile, well, thank you for your question, first of all. And the exile is familiar with, um, with conditions that that said it's, it's a maybe a postmodernist critique um, tries to do from a theoretical point of view. In exile, the dislocation that comes from exile, the sense of of discontinuity and disruption from one's history, makes you immediately ahistorical in some manner uh, as an as an exile. The process of dislocation immediately creates this exilic imagination in which you uh, begin this process of reinvention of identity that, that necessarily is a construction um, made out of, of a piecemeal idea of your understanding of who you were, what you have been told your family was, your country was, and trying to shape into the new reality, into the home to be, which is always out of reach um, a new a new sense of belonging, which is also always out of reach. So the tension between that out of reach belonging and a past that you can no longer retrieve is, is sort of the, in, the inherent position of the exile, is the natural position of the exile. So when you look at intellectual concerns of, um, of disruption or, or, or identity as construction or many of the postmodernist critique of, of the very idea of truth, they're all familiar to the exile. I mean, the exile, for an exile, the very idea of truth is always a Frankenstein idea. It's made out of stitched together pieces that by some crazy invention and quite often imagination, you, you give these pieces and stitch together ideas life, to breathe life into them. And you say, this is, this is what I'm after. This is the home. This is my identity. And it's always, it's always in, that, in that state of fear that it completely returns back to the lifeless creature from which you made it. And, and I think that all of us, whether exile or not, in many ways, that's, that, that, that is 
the world we live in is that when you are not in exile, you might not realize that's the world you live in. You actually have more trust in notions of identity. You have more trust in notions of, of home. You have more trust in notions of temporality as they affect um, our own choices. So for that reason, I think the exilic condition is an inherently uh, critical uh, condition um, and a searching condition. I don't, I don't know. I don't know if I've even touched your question. No, I really like the way you're framing this. Um, and I'm glad I asked the question though. I'm happy to sort of abandon it. I like it as a point of departure, but everything you're saying really resonates with me. And um, I, I guess what came to mind also is like when I think of in my own family history uh, or context, I think of exile as almost a a place where like new social relations, like the birthplace of new social relations as well. I don't know if that, that ties yeah, into I mean, this, but. No, I mean, I knew social relations, absolutely. I think partly because I, in, the, in sort of this exilic imagination and reinvention, you begin to construct a world, a world that probably for you, some of it is, is where you came from or where your family came from. A lot of that world is usually a world of memories and stories. You can never touch it because you might never be able to go back there where you come from. And even if you did, that world would be different because time is different. So you have this weird thing that is ethereal and then you create a home of practicality, new friends, new homes, new language. Uh, and, that, and then the, the social relationship sometimes is all you have to, to define this new reality because everything else is, is questionable. Um, and also, depending on the political conditions of your exile, um, there's always the fear that it will happen again, that everything that you build, everything you construct is, you know, it's a house of cards, it's a ice castle that can melt at any moment. So there's that threat um, that sometimes makes you feel you're far off course. Uh, and far, of course, from a destination you don't even know what it is. That's the great, that's the weird part about it. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you. I, this is really making me think of uh, what, what you're describing is like there is no there there and yet, yet you still calibrate to it. Yeah. Um, but thank you so much for your, for your answer. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you, Malvika, for the question. Um, I'd love to ask my own question, if that's all right. Um, you mentioned, uh, like halfway through the talk, uh, a kind of comparison between your writing and your art, and also writing and art, um, and their various kind of relationships to irony. And I, I, I was reading recently about um, uh, theater doc, which is I think a, a Russian uh, kind of leftist um, group. Uh, that holds a, a, to a kind of a ethos of adamant sincerity and um, and given all the kind of the irony poison that I think is definitely not uh, exclusive to Russia, but uh, thinking of a, a way to respond to a state of irony poison through um, theater was interesting to me because um, as we were saying, different mediums seem to have different kind of levels of uh, complicitness with irony. And I'm just wondering about if you could speak more about what it is specifically about images that, that are so unreliable, so kind of uh, in this precarious place, uh, whether it's art historical, I mean, pictures generation, or, you know, the way that images are just uh, against our consent everywhere in modern visuality. Um, I would yeah, love to hear you say more about that. Yeah. Um, you know, the question of sincerity that, that, that you touch on um, as it relates to in some sort of tension with irony, you know, is, is sort of embarrassing in some ways to articulate any concern for sincerity or for truth or for authenticity in a sophisticated, particularly sophisticated academic environment. 
um, because you ought to know better. Um, and I think that uh, when you get a bunch of people sort of uh, a, a bunch of um, art intellectuals, any claim of this makes you look like such a uh, uninformed person. So you, you should know better than that. And I think there's a lot of fear that is created out of this intimidation uh, through MFA programs and to education as a whole, um, that if you know better, the question of, of, um, of sincerity and authenticity is just passe and maybe something to be dealt with in, I don't know, late 19th century. <laughs> and I think I have seen then the question of, as you're creating visual images, that is what you're asking, as you're creating work, whether you succumb to the pressure of wanting to make sure that everybody knows you're smart. You wanna wink at people, they don't, you know, you're in in the joke. You know how things work. If you make a claim in any artwork, you always wanna make sure that everybody sees your, your, uh, your disclaimers, your winking, you're in, you're in it. You know, you want everybody to know that you're smart enough to know better. And in the creation of, of, of work, the creation of images, the creation of exhibitions and, and writing, when that winking is there, is, um, is always facile and is always safe. So I'm interested in people who create work when it's not facile and safe, where you're not winking, where people don't know if you're incredibly dumb and uninformed, or you are very informed in, and, and that that is not part of the conversation, that you placing yourself as an author in a safe position of, um, making sure that people think highly of you, which is the ultimate desire these days, and maybe always um, um, among the cultural uh, elite or people in cultural environments, they wanna be thought of well. And the word thought of well today means thought of informed and intelligent. But freeing oneself from that, then the possibility of creating can happen again. One of the great gifts from having come from science is that when I left science for art, I felt that I have to do no apologies because I knew how important it was for me. So physicists don't usually have to prove that they're smart is a given fact for a minute. But in art and in, and in, and in, in the humanities, we are so running over each other to make sure that our work is always proving that. It's always proving that awareness of conditions. So proving that intelligence. So our work, our images, the what we make is always bound by fear, bound by the fear that somehow we establish that well enough. So I am interested in work that seems to come across as dumb when it's not. Um, you know, like when you think of an artist like Forrest Best, or someone like that, that you look at that work and you, and it's not Mondrian, it's a very different thing going on here, but the intelligence and emotional resonance of those works um, do, do not come from, from the kind of constructive personality presentation that we're used to in the art world. So, so I think if I had anything to say about that, and I don't know if I even address your question, but is, we cannot let our work be obligated and subservient to fear and particularly to the fear of us not being good enough because ultimately then it becomes about us rather than about the work. And I think that is a problem. Yeah, I no, that, that gives me a lot to think about, especially uh, it definitely addresses my question. There's definitely something punitive and self-denying about this personality um and yeah i i <laughs> am very inspired to turn towards and then also to turn to my own art and think a bit more about how to balance these things um so we are going to turn over to um uh conclude with final remarks from our director and um publisher fong bui Sorry to interrupt Henry and Fawn, but we did have one more question from the oh. audience. 
came directly to me. And so I just wanted to give Patrice the chance to ask it, especially since it's been such a turbulent. So Patrice, I'm gonna pass you the mic. You, Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Hello, Enrique, how are you? Good, how are you? Good, coming from Oakland, California here. I had a question that has to do more with acceptance of change and how that might, or if it shows up in your work. Because I've, I've known your work for a long time and the concept of exile and loss of a space that is belonging or a feeling of belonging comes up repeatedly. Um, and I know that's very important to you. Does the concept of how change and transition can at some point be accepted and embraced even come into your work at all? Um, is, is that something that you grapple with? Yeah, thank you, Patrice. So Patrice gave me my first exhibition when I have left the PhD program and was starving in Oakland. Um, and, uh, and she, I won this competition that she was the curator of and it uh, made a big difference to me. So I'm very grateful to Patrice for all time. Um, so, so I think that one of the efforts um, in my work is to accept the world as it is. Um, I think when we talk about truth, truth and unconcealment and we talk about science and we talk about philosophy, quite often the effort is to to take the world as it is and understand the difference between that and what we like it to be. So we have our interiority and our, and our, and our urgencies and our preoccupations, but quite often a lot of the confusion that we feel is for our desire to, to make a world that is not what it is. And I think that the process of, of of coming to terms with time is evolution and the world as it is, 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 is part of that quest for truth as things are. Um, the discovery, you know, this is, this is why I often think that I am not so interested in, in confessional artwork, artwork that is so preoccupied with what I have been through, what I have suffered, because, because what I'm interested in is to try to figure out what is something um, that exists in the world that I can hold on to. And what is that? And part of that is a certain acceptance, acceptance of reality as it is, conditions as they are, history as it is. And that does not make you passive. So there is a difference between acceptance and passivity. So accepting the world as it is means seeing it for what it is with your eyes open and clear and then once you have seen it for what it is, whatever change you feel you can do to yourself and to the world, usually to yourself, is a lot harder than the chances you propose to the world. It's a lot easier to make pontifications about society than it is recognizing your own shortcomings. But once you recognize that, then to launch yourself recklessly, without a lot of preparation, with a lot of calculation towards your wishes and your desires. But the first step of that is acceptance and recognition, acceptance of losses, acceptance of things that are not the way that you hope them to be, acceptance of near misses. The near misses were something that were very painful to my family in particular, things that were almost there but didn't materialize. And I think many of us suffer a great deal because of this, because we felt we were so close. Artists quite often, suffer from near misses. So, so acceptance, I think, is a, is a deepening of our relationship to the world. And then from there, a spring forward to possibility and change and profitizing and, and, and shaping what we can shape and accepting what we cannot change. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Patrice, for the question. Um, an important reminder of how much work goes in before even beginning an artwork. Um, and so 
we are now going to move over to um, our publisher and artistic director, Fang Bui's final remarks. Um, Fang, you should be able to unmute yourself. Thank you. Thank you, Henry. Thank you, Enrique. Thank Eleanor, you. incredible question, despise of the trolls, you know, <laughs> which happen in this kind of uh, public sphere. I, I'm afraid to confess, we have a few times that it happened but we managed to pull through the continuity of thoughts, of concern. I really love that term that you say, continuity of concerns. Um, so yeah, I, I have two questions, but I felt like what you have described about being um, profoundly dislocated, you know, I feel similarly. And I know that this sense of dislocation uh, often, evoke a similar sense of mediation, the, the ability to mediate um, things that we read, certainly writers in exile, like Nabokov, for example, when he was up in Cornell, where Lolita was written in the early 50s, or he, uh, you know, V.S. Nepal. I love reading his uh, biography, autobiography, um, The Arrival of Enigma. You know how he came to um, Wilshire, England, came to New York and went back to Oxford, England, uh, and everything that happened between. So artists like uh, our friend Serena Sa, who show right now, highly recommend everyone to see at Babel Glass. Don't it's called Land of Dreams, and Serena and Soja Azari also applied to this condition, or, or to some extent, Ai Weiwei. You know, and many poets I know also. Um, you mentioned Anna Akhmatova, although she was how arrest during Stalin regime. Um, one of the things that make her poetry so powerful, especially in the volume of Requiem, is the meditation of time and memory. And I think that there's a way in which we have that capacity to elude being pigeonholed, being transparent. You know, we have the right to opacity. And in order to have that right and embrace that right, we, one has to be super courageous because like walking up and down the stair like Hannah Aaron described, thinking without a banister. I think that the ability to elude is the ability to generate a form of freedom. It's a, it's a very important thing I feel. Uh, you know, there's, there's calling for freedom within I feel there's a freedom uh, calling from without. From without usually imply um, an invested interest in seeking for external approval, as you describe about the academy and graduate school and PhD and whatnot. Uh, and, and, and always trying to provide all kind of strategy for answering, you know, and then therefore get easily pigeonholed by <laughs> other people, whereas inner freedom is really a, a, a way of, in, you know, push forward a poetic freedom that people can't really understand you fully, you know, and I feel that that's what the sense of dislocation actually, uh, we, I had that discussion with Jonas Makers when he first came to America in 1949, and all the things that he's creating is really a, a geography of imagination, you know, the certain fearlessness to think. So I, I feel deeply connected to that because I am also an immigrant. Uh, but it's so interesting, you mentioned Forrest Best, Enrique, you know, Eleanor, who, who was a self-taught artist, um, completely innocent, you can say, who, who make a living by being a fisherman um, in Texas, Bayside, Texas, in the early 50, could have been 52, 53, I think, he attended to a lecture by Maya Shapiro at uh, Austin, but University in Austin, Texas. A lecture was on Freud. We're talking about early 50s, so Freud was not accessible and widely known, certainly and in the academy. So he was so taken Shapiro treatise or exploration on Freud that he wrote a beautiful letter wanting to meet him. And then they have the famous correspondent which so beautifully displays 
when Bob Goldberg was invent, invited to be the uh, Whitney Biennial, remember? Like eight, eight years ago, Eleanor was so mm -hmm. brilliant. Uh, it went beyond the, the ability to have a set chain because he maintained an amazing correspondence also with Carl Jung and John Mo Money from Dr. Uh, Dr. John Money from uh, John Hopkins University, the, the first prominent uh, sexual, sexuologist. My question is, is this, aside all of that, I'm reading this book now by our friend, May May Bersenbrug, just recently published by a uh, new direction, it's called The Treatise on Stars. And one of the things that I love about this book so much, sees on so, like us, a poet in exile. And the way that I love the poetic or spiritual inquiry of, of her own uh, questioning science, what lies between physical law and the structure of living system, thought, memory, experience, causality, the perception of evolution, growth, and so on. And I just love Etel Anand, who's one of the poets we that Charles Bernstein interviewed a week ago, where she really thought of May May's book, pointing out the deployment of words. There is incredible uh, meditative patience. And she talked about, which is a very interesting thing. How do you describe meditative patience? It's a two process altogether. Either you meditate in order to get rid of what you know, what you're thinking, to empty out. And patient usually imply I am being patient for something or from something, you know? So the two collided into one and, and the, she, she, she reveals that the reason why the book is so beautiful, brilliant, because there's a secret rhythm. And that secret rhythm is exactly what you, you brought up for us best, you know, Enrique. So he had that vision. The painting is made emphatically clear is the dream in which lived in his head and he painted the dream. He never gone back and revision. Wherever laid down is laid down. It's clear, innocent, purity. It it's reminds me your painting so much of um, the idea of a snake eating an elephant that appears like a hat, you know, in, in saint Superi Le, Le Petit Prince, you know? Yeah. It, it's that wonderment, that innocent, um, Purity, a form of purity. All right, so that's what I feel out of hearing out of this conversation. But I have a technical question for you. <laughs> uh, Long-winded meditation on it. Your sense of color is muted. Um, it's not bright, it's not chromatic. It's rather slippery and moist and somewhat tonal. How do you arrive to that choice, that palette? <clears throat> it's nice to listen to your meditation about this, these things beforehand. Thank you for, for presenting them here in that. Um, that's a very good question. I, I don't know if I have a very good answer for you. I, I sort of gravitated um, I think, I think partly is a family thing. I think that I come from a family that my grandfather was from Southern Spain, kind of certain stoic quality in dress and behavior. And I think that that has always remained with me. It wasn't my, that part of my family wasn't like the more exuberant Cubans that you see, it was kind of the more um, introspective earthbound kind of, uh, Cubans so so some some something has to come from that I think that partly what I am after in my work um, is all, often that suspension that Eleanor mentioned before it's so easy to lose it mm -hmm. um, and any disruption whether it's chromatic or or making too many claims for something very quickly you lose it so I find a certain um, certain color relationships, maybe uh, trivial ones, perhaps, 
very appealing. Also, my paintings are almost always centrally composed. What's, in, what's important is more or less always in the middle, just like an icon, which is the most sort of boring and predictable kind of compositions that you can imagine. Oh, well, depend how you use it. Yeah, right, <laughs> right. Say the about Serena Sa portrait. Always. Yeah, so, so I mean, I think, I think some of that is there. I also love what you said before about the idea of a secret. I've always been interested in, the, in Hemingway's idea that what's most important about a story, you leave it out of the story. And I think that's really quite interesting, especially these days when we're trying to explain everything all the time. So, and I think color and, and, and sort of the way I applied is perhaps part of that secret. It's part mm. of that secret. It's a, it, it tends to be sort of a short circuit into a deep part of oneself, the way one makes those choices. Um, and I, and I try to always surprise myself, but how difficult is that to do, to surprise oneself? It wouldn't be nice if I was talking here and something suddenly, something I don't expect came out of my mouth. <laughs> that would be great, but it seldom happens. Mm -hmm. um, so I think with each body of work, sometimes I try to push, get to uncomfortable places, a dislocation that would result in a different sort of chromatic universe. Um, and sometimes it happens. But quite often I find myself um, taking some things out like that. This is not a very good explanation of or answer to your question, but. But uh, it's a first attack. Yeah. <laughs> but Maybe another time I give you a better one. Also, this is. No, no, it's okay. It's the beginning of, of something that we both think about anyway. And this is also for Eleanor, you know, the, the idea of secret rhythm that Atel was trying to understand in Meme um, poetry, uh, in a way, as we saw the video at the tail end, Eleanor, where Enrique was making the painting that in relationship or in the rapport um, with Keiko with, you know, it's a traumatic image. It's, uh, it's about a war, um, sort of mourning sentiment for sure. But in a way, seeing you uh, making a painting, what appeared to be very spontaneous, but there's also uh, a very willingness to go into the process of revision, wiping out things, put things back in, uh, you know, endless revision. And that endless revision is a form of precision that most people, if they don't look at closely in the work, when it's get complete, uh, would easily take it for granted. Uh, would you agree with, with that? Um, observation, both, both of you, Enrique and Eleanor. Well, I, I just, one thing I guess I'd like to say, what I think what's interesting in, I mean, the, the works are based on actual works by Katie Colwitz. Yeah. And in doing that, in a way, I, I think when you when you recreate it, you, you come to know it in a more intimate way um, than if you were, you know, simply to to look at it to even you know as a critic or a writer to write about it but to actually physically be involved in that recreation of it i i would think actually you know is is to have a a very different kind of knowledge of what that what that is so and that seems to be part of what's going on there right yeah i think i think that's true and what you said fong about precision i think is very critical is critical i think that in this question of moving towards a clearing of seeking something, precision, uh, which is not a word that is used enough as much as it should be used in, in talking about art. I mean, the reason why there's continuous editing and change and evolution and correcting is as that knowledge that then and or speak about as you get a knowledge of what you're after and, and the ways in which you're failing that which you're after, you begin to, to to, to get closer and closer to something and requires increasing precision in terms of elimination and editing and adding. And all of that is after, after something that, that however difficult to point to is, 
is definitely bright and clear. And that's the, this question that for lack of a better word, we call truth. And that truth requires that your movement is one of increasing precision as you move towards the material. Um, so, so that's that's part of it. Right. Well, thank you, Enrique. Thank you, Elena. Back to you, Henry Anderson. Thank you, Fong, for the observations. And thank you, Enrique and Eleanor, for the great conversation. Um, we are now going to um, conclude with one of the Rails traditions of ending lunch with a poem. We've carried this tradition into community events like today's. And I'm thrilled now to welcome our poet laureate of the day, David St. John, to the stage. Now, before I introduce you, David, you may need to dial six on your phone to turn on your mic. Um, and so I'll introduce you now and hopefully uh, we will be able to hear from you. Star six, sorry. Star six. Um, so David St. John is the author of 12 collections of poetry, most recently, The Last Troubadour, New and Selected Poems, as well as a volume of essays, interviews, and reviews called Where the Angel Come where the angels come towards us. And I will be putting links to these uh, in a moment in the chat so you can learn more about them. David is also a chancellor of the Academy of American Poets and a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. David, the floor is yours. So is that star six command working, David? It should literally be dialing it into your phone. There you yes. go. Hi. Henry, thank you. And um, I lost my power in a rainstorm here. So it's been really a, an amazing conversation. And thanks to Eleanor. And thanks to Enrique for asking me to be part of today's conversation. The poem that I'd like to read is called, The One Who Should Write My Elegy Is Dead. And it's a poem for the poet Larry Levis, who died almost 25 years ago now. And he was my closest friend in poetry or out. <clears throat> when I was 18, um, I met Larry and he introduced me to his mentor and friend, Philip Levine, who then became my teacher and lifelong friend. The one thing you might need to know is that Larry grew up in the central San Joaquin Valley on a ranch. And one of his best known books, Winter Stars, is referred to in this poem. Uh, the only other thing you need to know is that the triumph that's mentioned here uh, is a motorcycle. The one who should write my elegy is dead. When we made that bet, he said, most likely I'd be the loser writing his elegy instead. Nothing is as beautiful as nothing, he once said. So hip, just chain smoking camels are riding his shaky triumph up Van Ness. And the one who should write my elegy is dead. I guess I always knew. I'd have to write my own elegy for him instead. Rambo on a tractor, Anna says, or Jagger pirouetting through the ranch's drying shed. The one who should write my elegy is dead. So I won't rehearse again those hungers that we fed or expose both the cruelties and those we shared. I'll simply try again to finish writing this 
last elegy instead of looking back. And tonight, my daughter Vivian's off with friends and Anna's reading of all things winter stars in bed. And the one who should write my elegy is dead. And I'm the one, the loser, left here, just as he said I'd be left here, writing his elegy instead. Thanks, Enrique, for letting me be part of this day. Thank you, David, that was wonderful. Thank you so much, David. Um, and thank you so much to Enrique and Eleanor for the brilliant conversation, um, despite all of the glitches and troll attacks, um, but such are the perils of Zoom. So thank you, thank you, thank you for the great conversation. Um, and thank you all who tuned in today and thank you for those who asked questions. Um, we are celebrating the Rails 20th anniversary this year. So please consider making a donation towards keeping the rail and our special projects free, relevant and independent for another 20 years. And join us on Monday for a conversation between the economist Noriel Rubini and Paul D. Miller, uh, which will conclude with a poetry reading from Alex Cuff. And I will now unmute everyone in the audience so you can say your goodbyes on your way out. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Okay. <laughs> thank, thank, you. You so thank, much. You so much. thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Enrique. Thank you, Enrique. Thank, 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 thank you, Eleanor. Yes, yes. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank that you. was so wonderful. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you for reading, David. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, David. Thank you, Enrique. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.